Hello, I'm Kristen from Kristen Kane Style. Welcome, I'm so glad you're here. I am a style and mindset coach and I can help you go from stuck and overwhelmed with your wardrobe to a place where you absolutely love getting dressed. I do that basically by helping you get really clear on what's holding you back. And then we simplify your style and create a wardrobe that actually supports your life so that getting dressed can be effortless and fun. I do that with a program called Style Therapy. There is a link down below if you'd like more information. It is a one-on-one -on -one package where we work together either online or in person, depending on where you're located. And if you'd like to book a consult call, I do a free 30-minute Zoom where we see if we're a good fit. I hear what you're struggling with and then we decide uh, if Style Therapy can help. My guess is that it can. I've been doing this a really long time and it is truly my greatest pleasure professionally to be able to help women create wardrobes that they don't have to think about, where they can actually truly just get dressed and get on with their lives. So today I am going to talk about something style related, but it's kind of related to style in the back of the house sort of um, maintenance area. And I believe that creating effortless style requires a little bit of effort, which I know the same as makeup or hairstyles, we kind of don't want to hear that. We want effortless to truly be effortless. And yet there is a little bit of work, or in the case of clothing, there is a little bit of maintenance that needs to happen if you want your clothing to last and perform well and look amazing for a long time. And I think that there is definitely a, a trend of buying better pieces, buying fewer better pieces. Certainly I have pieces in my closet that are from Forever 21, that are from places that are not doing the most ethical work when it comes to creating style and creating fast fashion. I have pretty much broken that habit. Uh, and the pieces that I have, I have had for several years or I have even thrifted. And so I feel okay about having those pieces in my wardrobe and now I thrift almost entirely. And so I feel better about the sustainability with regards to my wardrobe. And I still want those pieces to last even if I purchase them secondhand. Uh, and certainly, you know, when I purchase a new piece, I want it to last, I want it to hold up. I want it to withstand not only seasons of style, I also want the fabric and the garment itself to last. And so I have, you know, amassed sort of a, a stylist toolkit over the years of things that are my go-to things for really keeping my wardrobe in the best shape. They do not require a lot of, um, they're not expensive and they don't require a lot of knowledge to know how to use. They're really pretty simple, basic things. And they're things that a lot of my clients I find haven't heard of or don't use. If they've heard of them, they're not actually putting them into play in their own, in their own homes with their own wardrobes. And so I want to share those with you today. So I have my little toolkit here. I'm just going to run through it quickly. There's no specific order of things. I'm going to tell you, you know, kind of how I use them or why I have them. And I would love to hear, you know, which ones you haven't tried, which ones are your favorites. If there are things you're using that I haven't mentioned, I would love to know that too. So it's going to be a little bit of a show and tell today. So I will start off by saying I don't have in front of me one of the things that I use, not terribly often right now, but that is an iron. I like to iron. I grew up with a grandmother who loved to iron, who lived in our home, and my mom likes to iron. And so ironing has always been something that is pleasing to me. I usually put on a television show or a podcast or um, a YouTube video and iron while I'm you know, learning or enjoying something. And it's kind of meditative for me and, and I like the before and afterness of it. I like dampening something that's cotton or linen and then ironing it. I realize that is not for everyone, no problem. Uh, but I do use an iron. So I have an iron and ironing board. I'm not showing those. My iron right now I think is Black & Decker. It's nothing super fancy. I use them until they don't seem to heat up as well. Um, and then I get a new one. They usually last me a few years and we go from there. Uh, I don't have to iron daily. I don't have a ton of things in my wardrobe that require ironing to wear them. I tend to go more towards knits, but when I wear a woven blouse, I usually do touch it up with the iron after it's been washed and dried. So an iron is the first thing I will mention. If you're not someone who likes to iron, then I would go with a steamer. So this is um, just the My Little Steamer. I got it, I think, at Bed Bath & Beyond. The top just pops off, you fill it, and uh, turn it on, and the steam comes out of these little holes and then you, know, you turn it on and then you just 
steam. Uh, you can steam from the outside of a garment. Usually I find that it's better if you put the steamer up inside the garment and then you just kind of hold the garment away from the steam with your hand and kind of run the steamer down the inside of the garment. There are lots of videos on how to do that, so I will not get much deeper into it. Know that the steam is very hot and you can burn yourself with that steam, so be careful. Uh, but it really does a pretty good job unless you're someone who likes a really crisply ironed white blouse or a fabric is really difficult to have the steam drop the wrinkles. More um, man-mades and silks and rayons and those synthetic fabrics usually release wrinkles pretty quickly. Sometimes the cottons and linens can be a little more difficult, but I find that the steamer is just good for freshening things up also. I don't usually take it when I travel. When I travel, it's usually turn on the shower nice and hot and hang a garment in the shower with the door closed if that, you know, if the garment has some wrinkles or some crinkling, you know, since I packed it. Uh, I find that that usually works when I'm traveling. So I don't usually travel with a steamer, but certainly they make small steamers and small irons. I also find that whether it's an Airbnb or a hotel, they usually have a, an iron that I can borrow if I'm in a pinch and really need to iron something. Okay, so steamer and iron are kind of my first two. I have always had them. I probably always will. I like to do those activities. That could be part of the retail person in me too, um, because I always liked steaming. You know, you can buy one of the standing steamers that has a big, um, water reservoir that you fill and then you have sort of the handheld wand with the hose. Those are not prohibitively expensive. I think for under a hundred bucks you can get one at Bed Bath & Beyond or on Amazon if you're someone who really likes to steam a lot. Uh, anyway, enough said about the steaming. Next thing, I could not, I don't think I could live truly without mesh bags. So the first mesh bag that I started with in my collection was this kind of, we have a few of these now. Um, it's for bras. So if you are not already washing your bras in a mesh bag, for me, it just is the only way to do it. They don't get tangled, they don't get misshapen, and then you can just hang them, take them out of the bag to hang and dry. The bags just unzip. I buy my mesh bags either at Target, sometimes at the grocery store, certainly Walmart, also online, kind of anywhere they have sort of a sewing um, laundry maintenance section, you can find these. So then I have several that are this size that are for camisoles and, and smaller pieces, and then I have them that you know, go up lots of different sizes all the way to pretty big sweater size that I can stuff, you know, with a big sweater. And they just unzip, you know, pop in the garment, zip it back up and toss it in your washing machine like this. So if I have anything that is delicate or that is dry clean only wool sweaters, things that have uh, a little bit of embroidery or, you know, that I wouldn't want to put just in the washing machine and have them rub up against other things, blouses and, and fabrics that say dry clean only. I'm a, I'm not a risk taker in any other area of my life really, but with laundry, I don't want to go to the dry cleaner. So I really put almost everything in a mesh bag and put it in my washer and wash it on cold. And then the mesh bag is a nice indicator that if anyone else were to pull those things out of the wash, that if something's in a mesh bag, it needs to be hung. I either hang or lay flat, depending on what the piece is. If it's a heavy wool or cotton sweater, I will, I have a couple old white towels that I will you know, just put down on the floor and then reshape the sweater on the towel and let it dry like that. If it is a garment that won't be stretched or damaged by hanging it over a rack, I have a folding wooden um, drying rack that I have had for years. I have uh, cyclist folks and runners in my family and so there are lots of athletic clothes that don't go in the dryer that need to be hung. So the drying rack is almost always standing up outside of our laundry room and blouses or things that are um, that need to be hung, I can do them on the drying rack. I also keep plastic hangers in my laundry room and I have a little bar in the laundry room where if it is a blouse or a shirt, I will usually hang it just so that it's hanging straight instead of taking up space on the drying rack or on the floor. Uh, and then when I'm ready to iron it, I will just iron it. I would like to be the person who takes things out of the dryer or out of the wash and rolls them up while they're still damp and then gets to that ironing quickly but that is sadly not the case. It would dry in a crinkled mess, so instead I hang them up till I'm ready to iron them. Uh, okay, next, uh, this is a sweater shaver. Now, for a long time I had a sweater shaver that was like a little, almost looked like a little comb and it had a metal edge that was real grippy and you just sort of scraped it along the sweater and it did a fine job. It took longer. It wasn't kind of, it wasn't very satisfying. I don't feel like it actually got all the little pills off of the sweaters. So at some point, someone online mentioned that I should have this $12 Conair um, depiller, uh, defuzzer, and it has a couple different settings so that depending on the, the pile of the sweater, how fluffy the sweater is, 
you can turn it down. You don't wanna go too hard against the garment because it will get into the little hole. You can possibly rip a garment. I'm always pretty careful because I don't wanna do that, obviously. Uh, the little reservoir comes off so that you can dump it. Actually, the whole um, top comes off so that you can clean out in the little blades. And it takes a couple batteries and it just makes this lovely satisfying sound and it pulls off all the little pills. Uh, so that your sweaters, whether it's kind of under the arm or, you know, in the front, when they start to get those little bumps and they just look yucky, this is the answer. It's about $12 Amazon Target. Uh, Target, they have it in store, I believe now also. Worth it. Next, we'll go back to a little bit laundry here. This stuff. I could talk about nothing else. If you only take one thing away from this video, it is Dawn Blue dishwashing detergent. I have no affiliation, no, this is not a plug for any other reason than this stuff is blue gold. So I decant it into this nicer looking container and keep it in my laundry room where I do have a sink in this house. I have not always had a sink in my laundry room, in which case I would just keep it in the sink that was closest, you know, near the sink that was closest to my laundry room, bathroom or kitchen. Uh, but I think that this looks a little nicer than this big bottle. Um, but this takes out almost every stain ever in the history of ever. Uh, it's really great on grease and oil that has dropped onto clothing and even been dried in the dryer. And then when I'm folding laundry and I see this lovely stain in the middle of a t-shirt or something, I immediately put some Blue Dawn on it and a little bit of hot water and rub it in. And sometimes I just let that stay until I'm ready to do that laundry again. Otherwise, you know, I'll rinse it out and wash it again. There's not really any rhyme or reason. I have never had it stain or discolor, even on, you know, crisp white. I've never had the blue cause a problem with staining. Uh, I've never had it lift color so that something darker faded with the Blue Dawn staying on it. All I know is that it really truly takes out almost every stain, specifically grease stains, which I mean, let's be serious, it is made for dishes. So it is really great at cutting grease. So it makes sense that it would take a stain out of clothing that was grease based. Uh, but it is the one thing that I will never be without in my laundry room. And when I find a stain that has been, whether I thrift something or whether one of my kids has, you know, gotten something on something and it's dried or myself, I am always kind of, I challenge Dawn. I think, okay, let's go. Can we get this out? And the stains lift. And so Dawn Blue, just the basic, you know, whatever their lowest price blue dishwashing liquid, you should have that in your arsenal. Uh, the next thing with regards to laundry are these wool dryer balls. I bought these at some sort of a craft fair. Apparently they're pretty easy to make if you are a knitter and have wool yarn. You can just make a yarn ball and then dampen it and dry it so that the yarn felts and it turns into kind of a dense little tennis ball sized um, gem. We have several of these. You can put some essential oils on them if you would like. I've never had a staining problem with that either. I sometimes forget to bother to do that. I never really liked dryer sheets for a lot of reasons and I found that dryer sheets would sometimes cause a residue or a staining on darker clothing and I thought this isn't worth it. And I live in Colorado, so there's a lot of static and I need to be mindful of not having any moisture in the air and not wanting everything clinging to us. Dryer balls have saved the day. So uh, they can you can purchase them on Amazon if you have any sort of a craft fair or a farmer's market or anything like that. Usually there are some folks who make them and why not support local and smaller, uh, but they're amazing. Let's see, next. Uh, what else is in my little basket here? So scissors, I keep a pair of scissors in, I have a little small box of the next few things I'm going to show. This is in that box, it's a pair of scissors. The scissors I keep in my closet for when there's a string, a random string or a loose something and I want to not just yank it. Uh, and also when I purchase something new, I'm really mindful of not just yanking the tag out. So I keep finally, I mean, it took me a long time to get here. I finally keep a pair of scissors instead of having to go hunt for scissors or yanking it, figuring, oh no, I won't make a hole in it. And then inevitably I maybe make a hole in it. So just a little pair of scissors so that I can snip off loose, loose threads and um, take off tags. And then I keep also a seam ripper. So if you're not a sewer, this is a seam ripper <laughs> and it rips seams out. And it's easier to use than scissors because it's really fine and small. And so if you have a new blazer and the pocket is stitched shut, or you have a new pair of trousers or something where you need to open up a seam that was not supposed to be permanent, it's a temporary seam, but the scissors are kind of awkward to get in there. 
I, I just like the way the seam ripper works and it doesn't take up much space so I can just drop it in my little container. And then let's see, there's one magic item I'm looking for in here and I'm not finding, Oh, I see it. Okay, this little gem, which I'm sure you cannot see, I will link it below. It, and I'm, I'm doing this hoping you're getting a little bit of better visual, better uh, focus, but I realized this might not actually be helping at all. So what this is, it's a little plastic sleeve because otherwise I would completely lose the item itself. It's a little plastic sleeve and in it is this lovely needle looking thing. And it's pointy on one end, just like a needle. It does not have an eye. You don't have to thread anything through it. The back half of this pointy thing, which is called Grab Nabbit, I think, on Amazon, which is where I got it. It's under five bucks. I should probably get several of them because this one seems to disappear often, and then I relocate it later. Uh, but this Grab Nabbit, I will link it down below. It has um, grooves on the back end. One half is smooth with the pointy end, and then the other half has these grippies on it. So what you do is, if you were to have a garment where there was a snag, like, you know, you've snagged a sweater or there's a piece of yarn or thread that's poked through, and you don't want to cut it because by cutting it, you could unravel a much larger problem. You take this little snag nabbit thing or whatever it's really called, and you poke it through where the snag is. And then in doing so, when you pull, the grippies on the end grip the piece that's gone rogue and they pull it through to the other side. So my mother used to do this when I was little, but she used a needle. So she would work, either wrap the thread carefully around the needle and kind of coax it through the back of the garment. Or if possible, she would thread the needle with the rogue thread or yarn and pull it through to the back. She taught me early on not to cut it so that it didn't unravel. Terrific. This just makes it so much easier because you don't have to worry about threading it anywhere. You literally just kind of poke it through and as you pull it, those little grooves pull the piece magically back to the other side. And then it doesn't unravel, it doesn't snag on anything, and, and you're done. So, uh, and it comes in this little sleeve. I would suggest keeping it in this little sleeve. I would also uh, mention that even in the little sleeve, you might lose it, or it might get misplaced for a little bit. Okay, so next, uh, denim. I buy a decent amount of thrifted denim these days. And so sometimes there are soft spots or worn spots or full out holes that need some repair. So I have started to, and I did this even before when my boys were little boys and they would get holes in the knees of their clothing or you know something would happen to their pants. Uh, I started to use iron-on patches. And so these are just iron-on denim patches of different sizes, different colors that I purchase either at the grocery store or Target. I have never purchased them on Amazon, but I'm sure you could get a lifetime supply. And they are sticky, they're not sticky, they are iron-on sticky on one side. So you would put it inside the garment and iron it on. I've used these in lots of different ways and they have saved the day on denim that had a spot that probably would have turned quickly into an actual unrepairable hole. And they just make it really easy to match the denim or use a slightly different color denim, whatever your pleasure. They're not expensive and they have um, really helped with my, especially thrifting denim and also with denim that I have just worn so much and loved that it has gotten a hole. So uh, those denim patches. These, are a new discovery. Uh, my son, when I purchased a pair of Levi's that were too big in the waist, and I loved them anyway, and I wasn't exactly sure if I was just gonna cinch them up with a belt or what I was going to do, he mentioned that the hip girls that he's friends with just cut sort of a slit with a pocket knife or a blade. They cut a slit a little further over than the buttonhole, and then they put the button through the new slit that they've made that would make them tighter. Hope that makes sense. Um, I didn't want to do that. It's not that I couldn't do that. I didn't want to do that. I thought there has to be another way. So he says, well, they make those buttons that you can attach. Why don't you try those? So that's what I did. So for about seven or eight dollars, I ordered a beautiful box of buttons on Amazon and they are, they're riveted, but not really. So I'll show you here quickly uh, how this situation works. So what happens is you, let's see if I can get one of these. It's a whole bunch of different buttons. Some are kind of brass looking, some are silver, some have some design on them, some are smooth. So you can pick whatever is going to work best for your jeans. And then the back has a hole in it where a screw goes and the screw is this 
little thing in my hand and then it comes with this nifty little screwdriver and it sounds complex but I promise it is not it's essentially like an earring like a post and an earring um, or an earring with a post and a back and so or a tie tack and so this pokey um, screw goes in the back of the denim a little bit to the I guess left if you're wearing the denim on your body a little left of the button because you're trying now to make them tighter so you want to move the button over so that when you button them you have a little less waistband so you poke it through and then you take the button and you once it's through the denim you take the button and you screw it on and then you use the screwdriver to tighten it so that you now have oops so that you now have like essentially an earring or a tie tack but it, you can wash it because it is screwed on. So it will come off if you want it. And it doesn't damage because the hole is so teeny tiny that in denim, there's absolutely no damage done to it. Um, but it allows you to, without any alterations, cinch up the waist of your jeans, even if the jeans aren't actually too big for you, but after you've worn them a couple days, the waistband gets stretched out. This allows you to put a button a little bit further over. So when you button it, it cinches in the waist a little tighter. And I don't know, I just like a fun little craft project like this. So I am, I have a pair of Levi's that I purchased these for, but I have since found a couple other ways to use them in my closet. And my daughter has used one. And so I have this little nifty box of um, denim buttons that I can use, you know, for jeans that are too big. Next, let's see what's else, what else is in my little bin. Okay, we're to shoes now. So I like, similar to ironing, I like to polish shoes. And so I always have a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, it doesn't even have to be Mr. Clean, whatever the generic brand is of a Magic Eraser, because I wear white Converse. And the, especially around the sole where you have kind of the white striped trim, it can get really dirty and yuck. And sometimes if I wash the laces and just dampen the Magic Eraser, I can go around the edge and wipe off kind of the scuffs and the gunk. And I don't actually have to even wash the shoes with clean laces and the edge cleaned up, the shoes look better. So, and any other kind of sneakers and that sort of stuff I use uh, the Magic Eraser on. I also like to polish shoes, as I said. So I do use shoe polish on my leather shoes. I wear Oxfords and loafers and those kind of things that are just leather shoes. And my dad liked to polish shoes. He, you know, taught me how to polish shoes. So I buy shoe polish when necessary. And um, I, you know, doesn't matter to me what brand really. This is creamy and more fun to use. This is old school and, you know, a little oilier and just as fun to use, I guess. And then I use a soft cloth or even a paper towel sometimes to put the shoe polish on. And then I have a couple of my dad's old shoe brushes. So I use the shoe brushes, these two, you can get at Target. Once you buy one, you won't need another one for life. I have one for lighter colored shoes and polish and darker shoes and polish. And then a really soft cloth. It's usually a mitt and it sometimes will even come. You can buy a little shoe polish kit from Amazon, or if you have some of the components, you can just kind of add. These usually come with the kit. And they also sometimes are in hotel rooms when you check in with like the shower curtain, you know, those kind of things. Um, and then you just polish and buff them to this beautiful shine. It's like the most satisfying thing ever. So if you're not polishing your shoes, know that that is one really great way to make them last longer because a scuffed shoe just kind of looks like you don't care and a little bit of attention. And it actually, I find it fun. It's meditative and it's, you're, you're repairing something that you care about and taking care of something that you enjoy wearing so that it will last longer. And I don't know, I just love a polished shoe. So I do that pretty regularly when I'm wearing all summer I've had on Converse or flip-flops or sandals. Uh, but when I'm wearing leather shoes in the fall and leather boots, I love to polish them. And then uh, I think lastly, maybe lastly, is just a waterproofing spray. So when I purchase a suede specifically, some sort of a suede shoe or booty, I always spray it with waterproofing spray because I don't want the water to soak into the suede. I don't use it on leather as much because I find that leather is a little bit more resistant to the water. And if I'm polishing the leather shoes, that also is creating a barrier and keeping the shoes um, moisturized and in better shape. But if it is a suede shoe that I'm not going to polish, obviously, then I, I do like a waterproofing spray. And so I just take them out back and usually put them on a piece of newspaper and just spray, you know, very simple kind of back and forth like you would be spray painting almost. It might initially look like it's darkening the color. It will give you that warning on the, on the container. I usually find that as soon as it's dry, the color is back to normal. I've never sprayed a shoe and wished I hadn't. It always, you know, comes back to the color it was. And then it allows that leather, that suede to be more water resistant in the event that, you know, I spill something, you know, drop something on it or it's raining or snowing or that sort of thing. Uh, 
So I think those are all of my tools. Let me, yeah, that's it. That's all that's in my, my stylist toolkit. I would love to hear, like I said, if any of these are tried and true things in your home and also what things I missed. What do you use that you love? Because I'm certain there are other things. Uh, these are just my go-tos for the most part. I do also have a needle and thread in case I need to put a button back on or you know stitch a little hole in something. Uh, and I, I can sew, I don't love to sew. I don't, I, my sewing pile kind of backs up and then all of a sudden I am forced to, you know, kind of stitch up the things that are needing mending. But, so I do keep a, a little sewing kit and needle and thread for that. Uh, but that's about it. That's, that's what's in my stylist toolkit. I would love to hear about your tools and things you love and what I forgot. And uh, I will be on Instagram on Tuesday doing a style Q&A live at noon mountain time. So if you have any questions, you can DM them to me over at Kristen Kane style on Instagram, or you can drop them in the comments below and I will add you to the list for next Tuesday. All of those style Q&As get recorded. So the replay is available long after you can go back and watch old versions and check through the questions and see what you might like to learn about. And if you'd like to work with me one-on-one -on -one style therapy, please check out the link below and book your consult call so that we can hop on a Zoom and really see how we can move forward to get you a wardrobe that is effortless and that is authentic and lights you up when you wear it. I would love that. Uh, I hope you have a really beautiful week and I'll see you next Friday. Thanks so much for being here.